Um, and hopefully you're in the right place. We're here for a session, Let Me Tell You What I Wish I'd Known, um, by Brian Mills. He's the director of Campus Recreation and Wellness at the University of Houston Clear Lake Campus. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. And I have a feeling it's fairly cold uh, for most of us. Uh, Houston, we got down into the 50s, so everybody's freaking out. Um, so thank you all for joining me this morning. Um, sorry, I got to figure out how to work all these screens. Um, so I'm going to start out. Thank you to our sponsors. They're all listed right here. Um, huge shout out to all of them for, for making this conference uh, free for everybody. And then also make sure on behalf of the Region 4 Communication Committee, uh, please follow them on all the social media platforms. Um, I don't see a MySpace account on there, Jeremy, so I'm going to need to get that from you pretty soon. We'll need to update our slides. You're right. Yes, please. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, um, so here are the learning outcomes that I submitted uh, months ago without really kind of thinking them through. Um, I'm going to skip over them because who knows what you're actually going to learn from this. Um, but I am going to share some information about my experience being a new director um, and my experience being at a new school with a brand new department and a brand new facility and all the challenges and fun stuff that has come up through that. Um, so Ross Rodriguez asked earlier how many uh, clips from Hamilton are going to be included in this. It's going to be a lot. Um, not so much clips, but definitely if you have not seen the movie Hamilton, um, one, where the heck have you been for the last several months in quarantine? Uh, but also, for those that know me, um, music, movies are really important to me. Um, it's one of the concepts of emotional intelligence, um, that you are aware of what makes you happy, what makes you feel good, uh, what brings down your level of anxiety. And for me, that's a lot of movies and especially musicals. Um, so joking around earlier with Cato that uh, The Greatest Showman was one of the greatest movies I've ever seen in my life. When Hamilton came out, I think I watched it three or four times in the first weekend and pretty much have played the soundtrack nonstop. Um, so as I was going through and watching and listening to Hamilton, a lot of things really kind of came to the forefront for me as a new director. Um, and so I'm using Hamilton as a framework for some of this. So again, if you haven't seen it, you may not understand all of it, but for those who have seen it, hopefully you're giggling right now. Um, but obviously the title of my presentation is, you know, let me tell you what I wish I'd known. And that's obviously coming from um, one of the songs where it goes on to say, when I was young and dreamed of glory, you have no control who lives, who dies, who tells your story. First things first, nobody died um, so far in any of this. So yeah, risk management. Um, but I, you know, I think for those again, who know me know that uh, I've been around, especially in the state of Texas for a while. Um, definitely young and dreamed of glory at a lot of different schools that I've been at. Um, and so becoming a director was, is a huge deal for me personally and professionally, but hopefully I'm also doing the job that's making everybody who's helped me get to where I am now, you know, proud. All right. So things that we are going to talk about today, I broke this down and hopefully we get through it. We'll see. I may be blasting through some of these um, and I do apologize for that. Um, but I'm going to focus on 10 main things that I've learned in, in becoming a new director. And I also want to say this, very few things that I'm going to say are going to be mind blowing. Um, but my hope is that it reiterates or reinforces things that maybe you have learned either as a young professional or somebody who has been in the field. Um, or that it reinforces things that, that we as a profession believe in. Um, so again, you may not walk out of here with a whole bunch of brand new knowledge, uh, but I hope that you walk out of here with maybe some new ideas um, or maybe just a better sense or, or a stronger feeling of who you are and what you're doing is important. Um, so first thing I'm gonna talk about a little bit is personal health and well-being. Um, I'm gonna share briefly about emotional intelligence. Uh, building something from nothing is worth the time and energy. Budgets aren't just given. That's a, a very hard lesson to learn. Um, staffing culture doesn't happen just because you want it to be so. Uh, collaboration or flail, especially in the times of COVID. And just because it works somewhere else doesn't mean it's going to work everywhere. Uh, you need to learn things outside of your job. You need to learn to pick and choose your battles. And then the last thing that I want to leave everybody with is we've got to remember our why. All right. So getting into this before, uh, I'm going to give you all just a very brief recap of the University of Houston Clear Lake. Um, honestly, most people in the state of Texas don't know we exist, um, especially in the campus rec and wellness field, because we've honestly only been on the map for about two and a half years now. 
but our university was built in seven, um, 1976. Um, it was designed for upperclassmen, masters and terminal degrees only. And really and truly it was built for NASA. Um, it was the play, we, we share a fence line with NASA and that was where NASA would send employees to get advanced degrees. The funny thing about our campus is our main building is if our university failed, they were gonna convert it into a mall. So when you walk through our main building and you see it, you're like, oh, okay, cool. We haven't failed. Uh, in 1999, the original rec center was converted into uh, an engineering building. And so they went um, a couple of years without any sort of indoor facilities. Um, there was a field space, uh, two outdoor basketball courts and four tennis courts. In 2004, they opened up a 3000 square foot room in the first new building to come on campus um, since the 80s. And that space was all they had from 2004 until 2018. Um, that space was overseen by a multitude of different people, but they never actually had um, campus rec dedicated staff until a couple of years before I got here. Um, but before that, it was usually overseen by somebody from an academic department or from the student life office. In fall 2014, the university began admitting first year and, and sophomore students. They were expecting thousands of students to come flocking to campus. I think we're still right around a thousand freshmen, sophomores combined. Uh, so those numbers haven't panned out the way that they had thought. So we are still very young in terms of trying to have a campus that is a more traditional campus. In 2015, they passed a referendum uh, for the construction of the Rec and Wellness Center and to hire, quote unquote, some staff. In 2017, um, I interviewed on a Thursday. They broke ground on the Friday after that. I jokingly was like, should I come back tomorrow? Go ahead and get my pictures taken just in case. They laughed, they did hire me. Uh, in June, I started. In July, I had my first meetings um, with the architects and our uh, the UH Clear Lake project team. In July and August, um, so two months into my job, um, I'm gonna talk about pro formas later, um, but even not having a not in, intense knowledge of departmental budgeting or university budgeting, there was a lot of issues and I'll share some of those later on, but I took those to my VP at the time. Um, and that story gets real sad, real fast. Uh, in August, our new president started. Um, and that was also the first time that I actually met with the actual construction team. So they did not let me go and sit in on meetings for the first two and a half months that I was here. In August and September, we had Hurricane Harvey hit. And for those that remember that, it was devastating for the Houston area. Uh, in October of 17, we hired our first assistant director, but he did not start for four more months. In 2018, Emmanuel Akajerim came on board. In April and May, we started hiring our student staff and grad assistants. July, we hired our first coordinator for business and member services. Her first two weeks were dedicated 100% to fusion training. I did not meet with her one-on-one -on -one until her third week of employment. In August, construction finished. End of August, we opened the doors. Three days after we opened the doors, my vice president retired. In September, um, multiple other people that were part of the construction and planning team also retired from the university. In 18, uh, September, an interim VP was announced and he started in uh, October, he reorganized the Division of Student Affairs and placed us in the health and wellness portfolio. Uh, which took us out of the uh, student life area. Um, in October, we hired a fitness coordinator. In November, we lost roughly 40% of the staff that we had hired to open the building. In November, we lost two of our five grad assistants. Um, it was a very interesting year. In 2019 summer, our new vice president started. He is still here and doing well. And at the end of our first fiscal year as a department, we were almost half a million dollars in the hole. And we had roughly 70% student staff turnover. In 2020, we were on track uh, to increase our facility usage and generate about 30% over our projections for revenue. And stupid COVID ruined all of those plans and we ended up losing almost $600,000, $700,000 in the last couple of months. So that's a little bit about what we've kind of gone through in an overview. About me and where I came from, I started at Stephen F. Austin. I transferred to UT Austin. Um, there I began my, my undergrad career in, in uh, rec sports under uh, Darcy Dahl. Um, I developed lots of lifelong friends and got to be introduced to a whole lot of future mentors. Graduated in 01. 
And then I started at Rice University as an intramural coordinator. And Tina Villard, I think, still rues the day that she hired me. Uh, in 2003, I was a grad assistant at Ohio University for intramural sports. In 04 to 06, I was a coordinator for intramural sports at Texas A&M Commerce. And from 06 to 2012, I spent six years at Stephen F. Austin, married my wife, had two daughters, had two back surgeries to go with those, um, and had probably one of the best experiences of my professional and personal lives. In 2012, uh, after my back surgeries, I moved to the University of Houston and there, intramural sports, sport clubs, family programming, took on more roles outside of, camp, um, of just what we were doing on campus, got more heavily involved with nurse at multiple levels, um, hosted regional tournaments and did all those fun things. But that was my opportunity. That was my shot to really advance myself professionally and personally while at a larger school. From uh, U of H, I came to UH Clear Lake in 2017, and this is absolutely what I consider to be my shot. Um, and this is just, there's pictures thrown in uh, through this because it helps me stay focused on the fact that I've been given an opportunity to create something from nothing that impacts literally thousands of students. Um, and so we're not gonna throw it away. So the number one thing I wanna share a little bit about is personal health and well-being. Life is going fine because my family is in it. Um, the older I have gotten, the more important it, is be it has become for me to spend more quality time with my wife and my daughters and my father-in-law and my parents and my sisters, my friends. Um, and that is one thing that sometimes gets lost in the shuffle um, in campus recreation and wellness. Um, we tend to, to think that our jobs, you know, require, you know, 24 hours, seven days a week, so, you know, that, that kind of mentality. And that's a great mentality to have in spurts, but it's not one that can uh, be, be the norm. And especially moving into a director position, I have found that I have had to be very focused in terms of um, staying on top of my own personal health um, and especially focusing on my emotional health. Um, the way that I've been able to, to do that a lot of the times is that um, <clears throat> I, I tend to get here very early. I've seen the sunrise in my building more than I would probably say anybody in the state of Texas has seen. Um, I, I get up at 4.30 in the morning. I get to work by 5.45, 6 a.m. I get some work done. And then I work out every single day because that's what I need to stay going. I try to leave a little bit early so I can beat traffic home and I'll try to spend as much time as I can with my kids, my wife, because they're the most important things to me. But that is something that as you advance in campus rec and wellness, you've got to figure out how you are going to be able to balance those things um, effectively. When I get to give my grand opening speech and I rewatched it last week, just to remind myself, I jokingly made a comment that I wanted to thank my wife and daughters. Um, they were the last people that I thanked uh, during my, my, my grand opening speech. And I just joked that, yeah, I can't wait to meet them. And everybody got a good laugh out of it. And, the, and that really, was funny for me, um, but it also really was something that that there's honesty and humor. Um, and I really did miss my wife and, and kids in the, in the months leading up to this. Um, so my best strategies for making this a priority is that balance is a verb, it's not a noun. It's not something that just exists because you say it needs to exist. Balance is going to change from month to month, from semester to semester. And it's important that you make sure that you look at it as an action. You have to make balance happen. When you are present at work, you need to be present at work. You cannot come to work and bring family concerns, issues, and stuff like that. If you are not mentally going to be prepared to do your job on a day-in and day-out basis, then you need to take time away so you can get that stuff taken care of. Unfortunately, in 2020, my team has been hammered by, by family health issues. And I, I lost a, a mother-in-law back in March. And that was one of those things that we knew it was coming. And when we knew we were right towards the end, I told my boss, I need to be away for a couple of days. And it was one of those things that because we were prepared for it, we were able to proactively take care of it from a work standpoint. And there really was no issues, all right? When you're present at home, you need to be present at home. Again, I love my wife and I love my daughters, but it is one thing to go home and then turn on your computer and immediately start checking emails again, or to be on your phone nonstop looking at social media, what's going on in the building and stuff like that. When you are home, you need to start at a young professional age of flipping that switch as best you can, all right? 
you need to do a better job. Uh, we as a, we as a whole need to do a better job of knowing our overall schedules. I always think back to my time at Stephen F. Austin that our director used to give us an Excel sheet of 365 days, and it was one of those things that at the time I did, really didn't understand it. But the older I have gotten and the more years that I've done this, the more I realized that our director at that time, Jeff Husky, was trying to let us see the overall picture so we could plan accordingly with vacations and time off and things along those lines. And so if that's not something that you are doing on a regular basis, you need to be doing it. Again, plan ahead for vacation and time off. My wife is already planning our summer 2021 plans. Come hell or high water, come COVID or no COVID, she has plans on top of plans on top of plans. I love seeing Justin Cato's social media because they go camping all the time. And I'm jealous I haven't gotten invited, you jerk. All right. But I know that he's able to do that because he and his family are planning ahead and he is a, as an associate director is working with his team to make sure that those are things that aren't going to put other people in difficult situations. You need to be able to reinforce balance and well being to your staff frequently. All right. And this is one thing that I've seen done well at some schools. I've seen it done well at times at other schools, but a lot of times I've also seen it fall to the wayside. So if you supervise staff, even if it's undergrad staff or a grad assistant, all the way up to a director who oversees multiple staff members, we've got to make sure that that concept of balance and taking care of yourself personally, um, both physically, mentally, all those other domains of wellness needs to be something that we reiterate and reinforce consistently throughout the year, not just from time to time when we see somebody, you know, maybe at that red line of I'm about to, to lose it. All right. Don't be afraid to take a day off just for yourself. I hate that movie theaters are closed because that was what I would do. I would take a day off and I would sit in a movie theater. Um, unfortunately, I can't do that now, um, but it is okay to just have a day where you do nothing. There's nothing wrong with that. All right, moving on to emotional intelligence. It is required for everything that you do. And if you do not understand the concept of emotional intelligence, uh, the very basics are this. There's there's four main don't, there, there's four main components of it. Number one is self awareness. All right, the ability to recognize and understand your moods, your emotions, what drives you, what makes you happy, what makes you sad. Then you move on to self-management. Now that you're aware of those things, how well do you manage yourself, all right? Social awareness, can you pick up and read other people? Can you see what makes them happy and sad and motivated? Do you see what frustrates them or creates tension? And then the last part is social skills. I call it relationship management. How well can you see those puzzle pieces and put them together, all right? Because the last thing you wanna have happen in Hamilton is when John Adams, calls him a Creole bastard. Again, for those who haven't seen it, you're not gonna understand this. But I would be willing to say that Hamilton did not have a very strong sense of emotional intelligence because he definitely overreacted to a lot of things that took place in his life, especially in the musical. So again, my plug for Disney Plus. But emotional intelligence at work looks like a lot of different things. So from a self-awareness standpoint, like I said, you need to know what makes you happy, what brings on stress for you, what recharges your batteries. But most importantly, you need to know what balance feels like for you. Again, balance isn't, does not mean 50-50. It does not mean eight to five, I'm at work, and five to, to 10, I'm at home. That's not the concept. It, it, there's give and take and all of those things, but you need to know what balance feels like for you. From a self-management standpoint, I cannot reiterate this enough. If physical activity is an important part of who you are and what you do, if physical activity recharges your batteries, you cannot skip doing those things, all right? Because it will negatively impact you. There is a ripple effect to that decision. You also need to know how well, um, or actually, how well do you actually know what you're doing on a daily basis? Back before COVID started, um, I was uh, doing leadership coaching with Tina Villard at Rice. And one of the things that I that I said for myself was I was going to start tracking my time. How was I spending my days? Because I felt stressed out all the time. And what I did, any, any task that I spent more than 15 minutes on, I wrote it down. And I ended up having my entire team do this um, in the two months right before COVID hit. And what we found was we were spending a lot of time just running in sand, that we weren't actually being productive. We were just doing things because we thought that's what we needed to be doing. So it's important for you from a self-management standpoint to understand how exactly are you spending your time and is it being used effectively, all right? From a social awareness standpoint, and this goes for young professionals, you have got to learn how to read a room. All right, virtual meetings suck. 
for people who have high levels of social awareness because it's difficult to see how people are reacting. Right now, Ross Rodriguez looks kind of engaged, but now he's giggling. Ha ha ha, he said my name. I see Cato smiling, I see Ken smiling, but I can only see those three people, all right? Uh, but being able to read a room is what you're saying and doing actually having an impact. Is it eliciting the response that you want it to get? Or are you saying things that are going over people's heads or are just falling on deaf ears? All right. And the last part for relationship management, you need to know what team balance feels like. So just like from self-awareness, you need to know what balance feels like for you. You also need to have a strong sense of when your team is getting off balanced. And that could be that you're hosting a major massive event. And so some members of your team are overwhelmed with that. So how can you help? How can other people on your team help? Um, when, when you start to get initiatives and projects from a vice president or even a president, and those things can maybe fall in one specific area, do you, are you starting to overload one part of your team where other people can start to pick up the slack? And a good example for that is we, we are focused very much on, on fitness and wellness over the summer. And they were also overseeing a, the fitness assistants. Well, we lost the majority of our fitness assistants over the COVID break because they couldn't work. And so reopening, we knew we would have to hire, train, and develop those students as well as online streaming, fitness and wellness, virtual opportunities, as well as planning ahead for some bigger projects that we wanted. I looked around at my team and I saw my fitness staff was getting very stressed and they weren't able to meet all of the um, deadlines. Well, here's my rec sports staff, my rec sports grad assistant, not doing very much. Eris, can you go over and can you help out with the fitness assistants? Absolutely, we can. All right. And we were able to take that big load off of our fitness team. So knowing and having a sense of, of your team balance as well. I also highlighted family concept versus team concept. And this is more rhetorical, but how many of you use the phrase, we're a family, or we like, you know, we're a family, we, we, we think about ourselves as family, blah, 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 family this and family that. I have tried repeatedly to get that out of our vocabulary, and I try to have us use the word team much more frequently. And the reason why is for those with strong family ties, is it easy to hold family members accountable, or does it create additional tension? And that's one of the biggest things that, that I have seen from a relationship management standpoint is we, when we talked about being a family, what I also saw was people didn't want to hold other people accountable because they didn't want to make a matter upset. But in a team, that's a different dynamic. And if people on your team aren't being held accountable, then that impacts everybody. All right. So that is another concept that, that we as, as UH Clear Lake have been re reimagining for ourselves. All right. Moving on to building something from nothing, it is absolutely worth the time and energy. It is not all sunshine and rainbows in a construction project. Um, for those that are at schools that have, yeah, Cato shaking his head, Ross is shaking his head, schools that I know have gone through multiple construction projects. It is not this, oh my God, that's a great concept, make it happen. It is long, it is grueling, it is frustrating. Um, not everybody that needs to be at the table gets to be at the table. Um, building a building or building a, a field complex or building an outdoor soccer arena or building sand volleyball courts or whatever it is, those are all wonderful things. But I have said this since the day that I got to this school and I, and I got a lot of frowns and I got a lot of people that kind of looked at me weird when I said this, but a building is a building. There's nothing inherently amazing about a building. It is brick and mortar and wires and glass. It is that, it is, an, it is an inanimate object that allows us to do the things that do change lives, all right? And that was something that was very difficult for the administrators at my school to understand when I got here because they had the field of dreams I, um, mentality. If we build it, they will come. If we build it, freshmen will wanna come to our campus. If we build it, everybody will be on campus. It's not how this works, all right? So planting a seed in the garden that you never get to see, that is a legacy. Um, when I got here, we had an amazing architecture team uh, from Smith Group JJR, could not have asked for better architects, could not have asked for a better team coming from that company. Um, without them, I have no idea what would have happened with our project. Then we had our campus team, uh, which was made up of individuals that, that were selected before I got here. Uh, but again, if you've been in a construction project, you know what I'm saying when, I'm, when I say this, but it's people from other departments that are going to have input in, in every aspect of the construction project. Again, 
there was not a campus recreation and wellness director. Uh, I think Tabitha Tipton was here at the time and tried to voice the campus rec side of things. Um, it did not go so well um, from her point of view. Uh, but then we also had our construction team, which was the actual like construction workers. And our team was very nice to work with, um, but they also didn't always see the big picture. And then you have the owners. And when we came in, myself and Emmanuel Akajiram, that's when things got even more complicated because that's when we started to becoming more involved in the meetings um, and started to have actual input on things that we needed, that we absolutely had to have versus, yeah, why are you doing it that way? Um, so it was very difficult to get everybody in the same book in the same chapter, much less get everybody on the same page. And I'll give an example of purpose versus functionality. We have a beautiful flat green space between our building and our brand new STEM building. We call it the backyard. Um, outdoor space is at a premium at a lot of campuses. Outdoor space is amazing to have. Outdoor space, especially during times of COVID, can be extremely functional. They wanted to put little moguls and hills all over this green space so people could go and lay out and sunbathe and study. Yeah, dude, we live in Texas. People are going to do that for like three months out of the year. You're going to create all these hills and everything. I can't use it for other stuff. It took me months to make them realize that if it was a flat green space with the drainage, we could use it for large scale outdoor events. I finally got them convinced to do that. And since then, that has become our outdoor movie area. We have hosted multiple massive outdoor events. We have another one on Saturday where we're getting to host a Halloween fest. And so getting people to understand that we that, that from Campus Rec perspective, we need things to be functional instead of what somebody a year ago thought that the purpose was gonna be, all right? Timelines, uh, again, Timelines of construction projects are very difficult. Um, there's always a lot of things that, that come up. I remember being at Stephen F. Austin, there was a concrete shortage um, throughout the country. And um, so it was difficult to get the prefab for our building, but it was also more expensive. Um, at U of H, uh, we were doing field construction and it was hard to get fill dirt um, at, at points during that project. Um, during our project, Hurricane Harvey hit. All right, that was three weeks of nothing's happening because people literally could not drive around the city. Um, and then after that, everything kind of got back on schedule because construction teams are amazing and they, they are unbelievably talented, all right? The other part of that is also comes down to budget issues. Um, for those that are in the fitness area, is it recommended or required that you have dedicated circuits for a treadmill? I spent months with our, um, uh, equipment vendors with our construction team, with our campus team, trying to make them understand that it's great to have 40 uh, electric outlets in a fitness zone. It really is, but you got to have dedicated circuits. They could not understand that concept. Even when our, um, our, our um, vendors came in and worked directly with the electricians, they still didn't get it right. And afterwards they go, oh, it's fine. Just rearrange your equipment. That's not how this works. All right. And so it was a very frustrating process a lot of the time. But in the end, because we were able to work a lot with our architects and have them be on board with what we were thinking and what we absolutely had uh, to have happen, that connection led to us getting what in what is one of the best buildings in the state of Texas. Um, I know that because we were on the cover of Athletic Business for a facility of merit. So, yay, us. All right, going into budgets. Budgets are giveth and budgets are taketh away. Um, so first year planning efforts, and I'm gonna try not to harp on this stuff too much because I don't wanna make anybody laugh too hard. Um, so I have asked for three years to see the actual referendum documentation. Um, where is the actual referendum? Where are all the notes? Where are all the, the, the meetings, the feedback, the stuff that was done with external consultants, so on and so forth still waiting on those things. Um, we have a pro forma. For those that don't know what a pro forma is, it is a 30 year, ours is a 30 year budget model that shows us the, the major expenses for the department um, that outlines everything from revenue and student fees, any, any kind of revenue coming in that's expected, um, and then all the expenditures. Our 30 year pro forma is flat garbage. There's, there's no other way to say it. Uh, every single person in Campus Rec that I have shared it with 
has just looked at me like, what? Um, it is something that is the bane of my existence. It is something that we have tried to work with <clears throat> developing a new pro forma. And it just seems that every time we start to make progress, something else happens and it gets put back on the back burner. Um, but a pro forma is something that is crucial for financial um, planning. And it is something that, that our university as a whole is not very good at. And I don't feel bad about saying that. We uh, looked at creating our standard operating procedures, especially from a budgetary standpoint. In our pro forma, uh, Ross, real quick, how much money do y'all spend or uh, project on student wages at UT Austin? For, for, for the fields? Um, for the semester or for the year? For the year. Uh, roughly $175,000. All right, Cato at b and Commerce. What is y'all's annual student staff budget projection? Uh, across, across everything, ballpark 300,000. Sweet. Um, anybody want to take a guess at how much uh, budget is allocated for student staff wages in our official pro forma? The answer is zero dollars because they did not understand that you have to have staff to run a building. When we came to, with them to project or when we brought our projections to them that showed three hundred and fifty to four hundred thousand dollars, they thought I was insane. And then when we said, well, this is why, and we went through this whole thing, um, they looked at me and said, man, I can't believe we didn't remember to add that. Really? Um, so again, some of it is, is very laughable. And I go back to the fact that almost every single person that was on the planning team is not at this university anymore. So you can do math. Um, we created our standard operating procedures. And once we had those and we got the go ahead, all right, we'll figure out how to make this work from a budgetary standpoint. We then had to reduce it even lower. So we essentially run the skeleton um, of what our overall plan is to operate our building. And again, our building is 81,000 square feet, two stories, multiple spaces that, that can't be seen from vantage points, outdoor space as well. Um, it's, it was something that they had not thought about because they had had 15 years of a 3,000 square foot room with one student. They thought that's what we need it, all right? Programming expectations, that, that budget allocation that I, their projection that I showed them also included programming. And they looked at me and said, well, what do you mean? Like, what, what, why does it cost so much for, for group fitness? Well, I mean, you just hire students, right? No concept of the things that actually need to take place to be able to put on these programs. And they also, again, had this mentality that the Campus Rec and Wellness Center, and this is one thing that I will literally punch people in the face at our campus for, oh, but it's a gym. Mm, no, it's not. It's a Rec and Wellness Center. Um, they did not understand the amount of money that it actually takes to do programming because at our school, programming is very limited. Um, and by that, I mean, there's not, a, there has never been a lot of spaces to do it. There's not been a big need to do a lot of, you know, really engaging uh, programming. And so they, they didn't understand that there was a pretty significant financial commitment that had to be made to be able to put on intramural sports or have sport clubs, to, to be able to provide personal trainers or group fitness and things along those lines. From a risk management standpoint, yeah, we didn't have, we didn't have any help in developing a risk management plan. I actually developed the entire plan during Hurricane Harvey because I was home for seven and a half days. So I wrote up a 74 page risk management plan um, that people looked at and go, well, what all is in here? Like, what all do you have to have? They didn't understand that you had to have a pretty detailed risk management plan to be able to have a facility operate. Um, and, and I'll get into COVID risk management a little bit later because it's kind of the same thing there. One of the other things that, that kind of goes into this is our mission, vision, and values and trying, and trying to tie that to who we wanted to be. Again, there was a disconnect between administration and what it is they were actually doing. Um, again, they saw our space in this building as being a space for so many activities. They didn't understand that this is a place that changes lives. They didn't understand or buy in to holistic well-being. They thought that this was the people will play basketball and they'll lift weights and they'll run on treadmills. Yes, they will do those things, but it is so much more beyond that. And so before I had a team all that entire year that I was here by myself, I gave 54 different presentations, just open forums, SGA, 
campus activities board, student organization leadership trainings, academic classes. I put on my own stuff, trying to have people understand that what we were trying to do was something beyond just building a building, right? And I always laugh about it this way. I was like, the university didn't spend $36 million to build a gym. If so, you don't need me. Um, we, we uh, especially when Emmanuel Akajerim got here, the push and the focus on student development because we immediately became the largest student employer on campus. Most of our departments at, uh, on campuses, we may not be the largest, but we are one of the largest. And the, our president, one of her passion projects is student development. We, have, we, we missed out on the first year and a half to two years of us being open and really showing the growth and development that our students have. That is a focus for us now because she doesn't really care too much about the raw numbers. She, she's passionate about student development and leadership opportunities. So our assessment plans have all been turned to focus a little bit more on what those passions are because, because we know those will, will make her look those will make her see that we are something bigger than what people think we are, all right? And I know I'm running a little bit, I'm a little bit behind, so I'm gonna start skipping around a little bit on this. So we gotta handle our financial situation, all right? So again, Hamilton was the Secretary of the Treasury. Um, our pro forma expenses that we don't have control of. So all the money that we do get from our st dedicated student fee, roughly $2.1 million, about 90% of that is gone before we ever see a dime which leaves us about 10% of our overall budget to handle every other expense that we have. Um, we have had to go back and we have had to ask for literally hundreds of thousands of dollars to support basic operations. When we, when we, before we opened the door, they had allocated zero dollars to buying basketballs and badminton nets and towels and laundry detergent and clipboards and pens. None of, they, they didn't remember that those things were important. And so this has been one of those things that we have fought every single year that I've been here and there is no hope in sight, all right? Programming trade-offs and opportunity costs. Because of our financial situation, we have not gotten to do the things that a lot of schools get to do. And you really don't think about it, you know, because it's just something that happens. Uh, my background is in intramural sports. Intramural sports should be happening. We haven't played intramural sports in almost a year because we, we just haven't. There hasn't been an interest. We have really haven't had the budget. And so we've had to allocate that, the money that we would have for intramural sports to other things. So therefore we have married other departments around campus to help supplement some of their programs and help collaborate on things. We try to support others when they lead other initiatives and projects on campus that we know that, that eventually we will be able to um, take on ourselves. We always want to look for our win-win-win scenarios. Yes, that is a reference to the office. You're all welcome. But if it's good for us and it's good for our partners and it and it creates a more engaging and, um, event for our students, then that is that. those are things that we look at before we say, yes, we're on board. All right. We also have to be, in, we, we have had to develop the art of compromise. We have wonderful ideas, but we really don't have the money to make a lot of those things happen. So we plant the seeds in other departments. Hey, wouldn't it be cool if we had a referral program for people in counseling and academic support services to maybe get some discount or free services from Campus Rec? That is a good idea. Man, maybe, maybe you should come up with that plan and let's see what we can do. All right. We also know that there are things that we have to do that it doesn't matter how great they are, we have to put them on the back burner right now, especially during COVID. There are things that we have to do that we have to eat the cost because we know in the long term, it's going to come back to be a benefit for us. So we're hosting a cultural extravaganza at the end of November for our diversity, equity and inclusion office. We are eating 80% of the cost on that this year because we want that event in this space for a lot of different reasons, but we know next year, we're not gonna have to do it. And if we can show them how well we can do it in our space, then they're gonna wanna continue to come back, all right? Number five, culture Trump strategy. Building a team is not nearly as easy as people think it is. Um, for those who are at schools that have, you know, departments and programs that have been around forever and, oh, we have amazing student staff year in and year out. Yeah, that's awesome. And that didn't happen overnight. That took years of people, again, planting seeds to develop that type of culture. And so when you're taking on a, a new challenge, starting a new department, a new program, you cannot take this part for granted that it's not as easy as what a lot of schools make it, make it out to be. 
All right. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to steal this from UT Austin because I love the phrase, but friends raising. As, as a new department, you have always got to be looking for people to help, people that are going to get on board, that are going to want to be part of what it is that you do, and, and more importantly, why you do it. Um, you have to be able to learn to utilize your students to spread the word. So I'm going to ask this question because this is a lesson I've learned over and over again, and it's a difficult one for my staff to learn. How, if, you have a, if you have a marketing team uh, within your department, what, where does their level of responsibility for marketing end? And where does the responsibility they get handed off to every other program to then go out and spread the message? And that is something that my team has been challenged with every single year, um, every single semester, every single month. Uh, we have an amazing marketing team, but we, we, we don't always make that handoff of, here's all the materials, we've handled the social media and the building, now let's get this down to our entry level student positions and let them go out and, and spread the word. And if you're not activating that army of students, especially on big, huge initiatives, then you're, that, that's a component that needs to be added for everybody across the board. From a staff management um, standpoint, especially when you're putting it together a team, you've got to paint an honest picture about reality. And I do not lie to, to people that we interview to bring on, even if they're students, all the way up to assistant directors or coordinators. I paint a picture of exactly what our reality is. They do not come in here with rose colored glasses thinking that everything's going to be fine. All right. Also, don't lie to yourself about the reality. I mean, COVID sucks for everybody at every level. And for those of us that are at this conference and that we still have a job, we need to be thankful for that. Um, but we also need to understand that there could come a point um, in, in the future where your position may be looked at in a little bit different way. Um, and so therefore you're gonna have to start making sure that you're taking care of what it is that you need to be taking care of and that you're doing something more than just what your job description says on a regular basis. Being a director at a very small school, I've taken on a whole lot of responsibilities. I, I've been um, without an assistant director since uh, October. We lost our fitness coordinator this, this October. We lost our assistant director last October. Um, so they're literally myself, my coordinator for business and member services, and we have five grad assistants. That's our leadership team right now. But over the last couple of years, I've had this mentality that I've got to continually take on more and more things, not to overload everybody on my team. And so I've, I definitely feel that I've got to shoulder a lot of burdens, but at the same time, I've tried to get a lot better at, at looking at that balance and making sure that I look at everybody still as individuals and, and understand that they have different parts and different points of where they're at in their careers, what they can take on, what they can't take on, what they can do well versus what they can't do well. And so it's important that we understand um, as, as a profession that at some point we do have to say, no. And we're not saying no because it's a bad idea or we don't want to do it. We've got to say no for ourselves. All right. As a new director, I've also fallen into the trap sometimes where I think I'm dropping knowledge every time I open my mouth. This is a presentation that's damn sure full of that right now. Don't believe everything that comes out of your mouth is important. Um, it has become even more of a focus uh, during COVID that I have not wanted to burn my team out in meetings and, and just wasting time. Um, so I think I think over this past six months, we've gotten much more effective and efficient in how we as a team communicate with each other as well. And I'm a diamond in the rough, a shiny piece of coal. I think everybody that I've ever worked for may or may not agree with that. Um, and I don't know how much of a diamond I really am. Definitely started out as a piece of coal, I'm willing to say. Um, but developing young professionals is a very difficult job. Um, and for those that have that do currently supervise staff, those that are wanting to progress and want to um, supervise staff, it's going to be the hardest thing you ever learn to do because it is not the same as managing undergrad students or managing grad students. You are managing a professional staff member and you cannot make them want um, any more than they're willing uh, to do. Um, one of the things that I've learned even more, I hate to say it this way, but brutally over the last 12 months is that you cannot overlook minor behavioral or performance issues. You cannot do it as a director or as an associate director, that those are things that have got to be addressed quick, fast, and in a hurry. And they've got to be done in a way that is both educational, but also gets, a point, uh, gets the, the point across that it's not acceptable 
to, to do those things. Um, that is something that um, unfortunately leads down some roads that I'm definitely not getting into in this presentation, but it's, it's not fun when you have to move into formal disciplinary to issues and stuff along those lines. All right. Uh, number six, collaborate or flail. I didn't say fail because you can still do your own things, um, but you need people to help lighten the load again, especially in the time of COVID. We're outgunned, outmanned, outnumbered, outplanned. Hamilton comes in, hey, I got three friends. Let me help you out with all this stuff, General Washington. Um, again, I spent a year by myself with six undergrad students, um, and it wasn't until the last five months before our building opened up that I got the professional staff that I needed. Um, you have got to find people that you can help, uh, that can help you and that you can rely on. Sometimes that doesn't always have to be a formal thing. And so I'm gonna ask these questions about identifying and building relationships because these are questions that I ask my team. Do we have student leaders outside of campus recreation and wellness and leadership positions? So if you're at a smaller school, do you have student employees that have run for SGA, that have run for office, that are involved in student organizations? If not, why are you, are you encouraging that? And if not, why not? It never hurts to have students in positions of, of um, leadership. All right. What are your most important current collaborative partners? How are you um, managing and keeping that relationship going during COVID? What things are going to be coming up in the next couple of months that may impact that relationship? We have a we have a partnership with our um, the academic um, department that that is within our building. They do research on elderly and how physical activity impacts that. Before COVID, we, they had 119 members of the Rec and Wellness Center for their department. We are down to 25 because they're elderly, they have pre-existing health conditions, and they don't feel comfortable coming in the building. And so we've got to figure out how do we keep that relationship going because it is an extremely successful program that we want to continue with them. All right. Which partners are you working with now that don't always follow through? All right. And is that a partnership that can be mended or is it a partnership that you need to just kind of let go for a little bit? Which partners make your department stronger? All right. Which partnerships make your life harder? And I think everybody may giggle a little bit like, oh, yeah, that, that department, insert name. All right. Or that person. All right. Which partners stand out to your supervisor? And again, this goes back to thinking about our president at this university. We are all about, or she is all about creating internship opportunities for students. Well, guess what department could literally create a dozen internship um, opportunities for students across the board, whether they're exercise science majors or they're business majors or marketing? This department. All right. So that could be another way to minimize budget as well as put yourself on the radar for, for the higher ups. You cannot always replicate success from somewhere else that you've been. I've been at some really, really awesome, cool uh, schools that do some amazing things. I look at other schools like Oklahoma State that have incredible intramural sports programs, but also have an amazing wellness uh, um, concept that, 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 from what I've gathered from presentations, you know, is divisional and departmental wide. They're um, speaking with directors around the state and learning more about what they do. Um, it is unbelievable to see so, some of the creative ways that our departments have, have had levels of success. But just because it works somewhere doesn't mean it's always going to work at your school. And as a department, as a leader of young professionals, this has been one of those things that I just literally want to bang their heads against the wall until they understand it. Because every single staff member that we have brought in from an outside school has said, oh, well, this is what I did in my school and here we go. Yeah, there are parts and components that are wonderful and transferable, but there is depth and there is culture that sometimes is the reason that those things run so smoothly or, or are so successful. And so it's important that, again, as a supervisor, that you have got to make it clear from the get-go, I want your ideas, but I want the lens of this school to be what you use when you evaluate it, all right? My favorite song in the Hamilton soundtrack is Wait For It. I, I would sing it, I'm not going to, but in that song, Burr is, is, is expressing a lot of the things that, that, that really shine light on why he is the way that he is and, and foreshadows a lot of the things that, that happen later on in the story and obviously in history. But you, it doesn't matter from the director, associate director, coordinator, it doesn't matter. 
you you're still the only person that you can actually control. And as a director, that is really difficult um, to to admit sometimes. Oh, I have this young staff, and I absolutely need to um, you know be on top of them all the time. Yeah, no, not really. We we you have to balance those things and. Again, it, it's not the best environment where I'm a young director and I have a young staff and we are full of ideas and we don't always have that, 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 that outside influence that tempers us, that brings us back into reality. But it is important um, that we also are very honest about our own limits, both physical and mental. And, I, and I've brought up mental a couple of times uh, because I am somebody who suffers from anxiety um, and it has gotten much worse in the last year and a half. And I share this with everybody pretty openly because I want to make sure that if you are somebody who also suffers from anxiety or, or different levels of depression, it's okay. And it is something that you need to, as an individual, make a plan on how you can, can get help with it, whether that's professional help or figuring out how to deal with it. Um, I cannot encourage you enough to not just hide it away from everybody and act like it's not a big deal because it, it is. And I shared this, I had a massive anxiety attack breakdown during a divisional staff retreat in January where I spent five hours in my truck uncontrollably crying on the phone with my wife and with my friends who helped talk me down. It was a really low point and it was something that built up over months because I, 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 I kept feeling like it didn't matter what I did, nothing was really working out the way that, that we expected it to work out. Little did we know COVID was gonna come along in two months after that and ruin everything anyway, all right? But again, I, I wanna make sure and, and really get that out there to everybody that, that it is okay um, and people are here to help you. Learn things outside of your job. Hamilton throughout the, the musical has a number of different jobs. Um, the next slide shows you just a little bit of what I do on a weekly basis. That is what I do, no lie on a weekly basis. I pulled 1,500 pounds of weeds out of our gardens um, the day of an alumni event because facility management and construction teams could not come and do it. And we were not gonna have our place, you know, look like a shanty town um, before this massive event. Um, I've been a movie star. Um, I have to unfortunately star in all the promotional videos that, that we do in tour videos. I am the point of contact for literally everything um, from outside the department um, because we have, a, we have an issue on our campus where people look at titles more than they look at the person. And so when I say, oh, you need to contact our grad assistant for fitness and wellness to talk about that. No, I'd, I'd rather talk to you. I can't change people's minds. All right. And so it's important, whatever your job is, whatever your title is, especially during COVID, I cannot stress this enough. Get the hell out of your little bubble of what you've been doing and you need to go learn how to do other things in other areas. I have been a fitness assistant. I have been an ops assistant. I have been a member services assistant. I am the custodian from time to time. You need to be willing to put yourself in those other roles and learn what it is that they do. I thought it would be easy to take over operational staff scheduling because hell, I schedule intramural officials for, for 18 years. This can't be that difficult. Nonsense. It's not the same thing. Oh, fitness is easy. Just get some group fitness instructors. It's not easy. If you have the opportunity to learn from your colleagues, you need to be taking advantage of that now. And there is no excuse because I, I can only imagine none of us are nearly as busy as we have been in the past. And there should be somebody in your department pressing you to um, be exposing yourself to these other things. I'm even gonna say this, get out of your department, go learn what they do in student involvement and leadership, volunteer for a committee out of your equity, diversity and inclusion office, do something besides what you've been doing, all right? You have to pick and choose your battles um, as a director and even as an associate director. Um, so I came up with my 10 dual commandments. Before I go into anything, I always make sure that I understand the implications of what it is I'm about to go into. Um, and I also think about it, if I'm in a battle for X, Y, and Z, how is it gonna impact my ability to, to have uh, my family be a, be a priority for me, all right? And not just me, but how does this priority impact my team's ability to be able to focus on themselves and their families as well. If you stand for nothing, what will you fall for? 
too many times we get dazzled with shiny lights that we lose focus of some of the things that we should be doing. We cannot forget our purpose. We cannot forget our why. All right. And that has to be something that is filtered through before we start taking on additional opportunities. We got to talk less and smile more. Maybe I'm not going to tell anybody to smile. All right. But we need to learn better to listen and reflect on what's happening before we react to it. All right. Both as an individual and as a department. Emotional intelligence, again, goes back into that. Being able to process things quicker with a better, fuller understanding and, and a shorter amount of time frame that comes with experience. Genius comes from hard work. Some of some people in our field are absolute geniuses. They didn't get there just because they woke up one day and all of a sudden they were smart. All right. There's also not a, one single person in our profession that is the end all be all go to for every single issue that may ever arise. So you need to make sure that you have a broad range of people that you can go to for different issues and, and different things. All right. Unfortunately, the, the, the Texas and Louisiana coast, we're kind of done with hurricanes. Um, this has been a bad year for us, uh, but you, we also have to understand that in terms of just how the semesters go and COVID and everything else, we've got to be able to take advantage of downtime and the opportunity to hit reset on some things. We, we've got to make sure that during these downtimes that, that we provide praise um, for the people who are continuing to work their butts off, uh, you know, that, that are meeting and exceeding expectations, not just from a professional or, or GA level, but all the way down to our students, because they're going through a lot of crap as well that, that we may, may not just be seeing, all right? You get nothing if you wait for it. There are times where as a department, you've got to jump on an initiative because you don't want to get left behind, but there are times where you have got to proceed with understanding the ripple effect of what that means. All right. And again, it depends on the initiative and it depends on the school. It depends on your divisions and, and university's priorities. I want to be in the room where it happened. I don't know how many times as a coordinator and assistant director, I was like, well, why didn't the director come and get my opinion on that? I know why, because I was an idiot. All right. And so don't be upset if you're not consulted on every little thing that is said and done. That doesn't change even when your title changes. There are things that happen within our division that we are not in the conversations for, and it can absolutely be frustrating. But what I've kind of learned is we can't let that stop us from providing that support and, and, and excitement for when it does get announced, all right? Don't let your pride be the death of us all. We've got to hold ourselves accountable as professionals, as, as human beings, um, and we've got to be able to to, to understand that we're not perfect and that we're gonna make mistakes. And what I have found as a director that I'm very quick to, to take the take, take ownership on, on, on things that we drop the ball on as a department. That, that's not always a good thing, but it, it is the way that I'm operating right now because I, I see a lot of the things that we drop the ball on as being a, a direct impact of me not doing my job to the level that I need to do it at some points, all right? And I know we're absolutely running out of time. Y'all can read the last two. So the last thing that I'm going to say, and again, I'm sorry, uh, but don't lose your why. One, again, one of my other favorite songs is Dear Theodosia. Um, and in that song, Hamilton and Burr are singing back and forth about their kids. Um, as a director, I've, I'm very much moved by the fact that I know that what I'm doing is making an impact. Maybe not for every single student that goes to the school, maybe not for every student that works for us, um, but I know that it is having an impact on, on people and on our campus and on, and on our culture. It's had an impact on me. It's changed who I am as a person, um, as a father, as a husband. Um, and so it is important that, that we always remember that we are working to build a stronger foundation for people that are gonna come after us. Uh, we may not have the success, we may not get the glory, we got to learn to live with those things. Um, if you are in this field for you, you're not going to have a lot of fun doing it because it's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about, you know, any of us. It, it is about our students. It is about creating um, a healthier, happier student uh, for your campus. Um, and it's something that eventually we will pass on to other people. And our job is to create the strongest foundation possible for that. All right. And on that note, I think I'm done. Um, so, I know that I'm, hey, one minute over, that's, that's not bad. Um, I'm happy to stick around for as long as needed. I know that um, this also may not be possible. I'm also happy to just create a chat room some other time. Um, so I'll stop talking. All right, any comments, questions?
Shout out Mills, go back to doing something else. Mills, there's a question. Uh, who would most likely shoot you in a duel? My wife. <laughs> my wife, hands down. <laughs> On campus, I think I could probably hold my own. All right. Appreciate all the kind words. Thank you all. Uh, my email, uh, millsb at uhcl.edu. Um, if anybody, again, especially related to mental health, um, anxiety, depression, I'm not an expert in that field, but if anybody ever needs to talk, please don't ever hesitate to call me. Um, I will make all the time in the world for you because I am somebody that absolutely suffers from that. Um, and I know how challenging it can be. So um, thank everybody, or thank you all for joining me today. Um, and um, yeah, everybody have a good rest of the conference. Mills, hey, Ian. I, just want, I just want to say thank you so much. Uh, this was exactly what I needed at my stage in life and my position. I found the, the content very uh, enriching. Thank you. Yeah, man, you're welcome, buddy. And Ian, you're one of those people like I've, I, I, we, we, all, we met because of COVID really, like we've had all those interactions, man. I've been super impressed hearing what you're trying to do um, and with your team and everything like that. And, and I knew the staff that was there before you got there, like, you know, I, I've, I've been really impressed with what, what it is that you're doing and how, and how you're going about doing it, so. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm hopeful uh, that one of the, the first things I really hope to do when I can uh, bring on and onboard this new staff is really start to figure out our lens and the, the, what our lens is gonna look like and what's gonna drive us forward. Uh, and it was cool to see all the different aspects of how you focus. And I definitely related right now with that slide about all the different uh, jobs that you, you're doing. Yeah, I don't know, that, that actually helps me out a little bit too. Cause there's days where I'm just like, I can't be in this building. I've got to go away. Um, I strung up, and Ross will laugh about this. I strung up that we, we bought windscreen for our tennis nets. Yeah. I went and strung those up by myself. Yep. And it was like six hours of my life. And I was like, oh my God, I feel like I did so much today. Nothing like a little quiet time with yourself. Yeah. yeah. I didn't, I did not do those by myself, but I was on the expedition for a couple of hours going down the, the tennis courts. Yep. I, I've been there. Sarah Shea. One quick question I do have, though, um, it is about officiating. I don't know if you saw it, but you were talking about balance, life balance. And I'm curious, you know, where you found officiating to kind of fall into that, especially as you transition from other roles to your director role. Um, yeah, um, I, I didn't take off any time when I got this job. And I made it very clear in my interview that that was important. And again, if, if people don't officiate, they don't understand it. But like, that is one way that I deal with the anxiety is I go rest. Um, but what I also saw, especially last year, was I started to have more panic attacks in the days leading up to games. And so like, I, I don't know how that happened. I'm not refing this year because of COVID and I've got enough exposure concerns that I wasn't going to do it. Uh, but what I found is one, I haven't really missed it this year as much as I thought I was going to. Um, but what I do miss is I miss that camaraderie with those guys that aren't at my school. That, that's what I miss the most is I miss my crew. Um, but I, I've always been very upfront with my, with my direct supervisors. Like, you can tell me no, I'm still going to do this. And so this is how I'm going to do it. And so I, I've showed them like, I'm leaving at two o'clock and this is what I'm doing to make up that time. Um, and so I, I've, I've, probably over communicated a lot of the time with my bosses about this. Like my boss now doesn't care when I'm in or out because she knows that when I'm here, I'm here at five 30 in the morning and I'm here until like four or something on, you know, in the afternoon. And she knows I come up on the weekends and she knows that like, I just am here way too much. Um, so I would just have very clear conversations with your boss about I've got it. This is, this is important to me. I think, that that's not so much the question because that's actually I get a great I get great support here um, from from that aspect that was that's been a conversation from the get-go I think for me especially as a young professional what, going from using officiating to supplement the income to doing it as a uh, as a hobby yeah. and, you know um, and going to that, that outlet and that kind of thing that's where I'm 
like, wow, how do I spend time with the family? How do I fit it all in? How do I do the... Yeah, and your kid's uh, really small, right? Like babies? Four. I have a four-year-old and my we're, we're able to say it now, but my wife's pregnant, so... Oh my God. Yeah. Awesome. Congrats. Um, my kids are both at, at an age now, and I think Barfield's kids are around the same age now too. Like my kids are actually fun. Yeah, right. I really enjoy like hanging out and spending time with them. Sarah knows my kids. She knew them when they were babies and you know, they, they kind of suck back then crying and whining and stuff like that. But like my, I, I enjoy hanging out with my kids. So I think that's, what's also made not refing this year that much easier because we have spent more time as a family. Um, and again, for like Jeremy, I mean, hell, even Ken, Sarah has known my wife and family. I mean, there's a lot of people in the state that, that know my wife and, and my kids I haven't always been a very good husband and father in terms of like quality. Um, and a lot of that was just because being in intramural sports and those of us that know it, like you're there at nights and you're there on the weekends. And, you know, if you're going to do your job right, you got to be present. And I really struggled with, with balancing those things. But now, you know, I'm at a position where the money isn't need needed. So I don't know, like it, it disturbs me that I enjoy not reffing so far this year because I could easily see me just going, yeah, I'm done. I don't, I don't want it to be that way, but or maybe I'm going to go ref volleyball because that's super easy. <laughs> volleyball. But, but man, but yeah, I mean, if you've got young kids, yeah, I mean, it's, I, I mean, I hate to just kind of do the, the Hallmark card of it, but like those years are fun and you're a lot more active than I was. And Sarah knew me when my kids were born. I sucked. <laughs> like I was fat and lazy and overweight. I had two back surgeries and when my wife was five months and eight and a half months pregnant with my second one, like I was worthless. Isn't that wow. right, Sarah? <laughs> so. I'll plead the fifth on that, Mills. I'm not, I'm not going to say anything. Hello. <laughs> Whatever. All right, Jeremy, we need to get off of this for the next one. Well, I was going to say th this had that the feeling of the, the between session banter in the hallway outside the conference. So thank you for making it feel more like, you know, a traditional conference. So yeah, we want to be respectful of time. I know there's an, uh, at least one session at 1130. So thank you all for, for hopping in. Make sure you um, rate and review Mills' session and we'll see you uh, later today. Thanks. Take care, y'all. Thanks, guys. Great yeah. to see everybody. Miss Good job, Mills. Good to see you, buddy.